we are going to get right into, we're going to switch the order a little bit and um, we're going to start things off with Jay, have him start with his talk. And then from there, we'll go into Chow and Marcus, and then we'll round off the evening with Stephen. And he's being super nice. Stephen and Marcus are both from out of the country. So it's like really, really late <laughs> or early, however you want to say that for both of them. So thank you to them for being here. We appreciate it. But um, one thing that's kind of customary for our events, Jay, is that we always start off our talks with a bit of a, a dev chat question, just kind of a fun okay. get to know you, right? Because you're about to, to share some angular awesomeness with us. But we want to get to know, like, who's Jay? Who is Jay? And I thought it'd be fun. One of our favorite questions, I think, is just a simple and yet uh, really fun question. It's like, what is your current favorite guilty pleasure? And if you need a minute to think about that, because I'm kind of throwing that on you. If you need a minute, Steve and, and maybe, well, Marcus, you can't because you're going to share yours in a minute. But I can share <laughs> one. Steve might be able to share one. Or if you're just ready to launch into it, go for it. But I, I think I got one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So probably a uh, toasted vanilla oat shaken espresso from oh. Starbucks. Okay. Yeah. So good. And it's, it's probably horrible for me. <laughs> and they're kind of expensive, but they taste so good. And they're espresso mm -hmm. and they just keep me going to keep me fueled. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, I feel like Starbucks is taking over everything, but I'm not sure that's <laughs> yeah. a bad thing. I just love walking in and that smell. The smell is, is enough, but absolutely awesome. All right. Well, let's pass it over to you. Your talk is called Eliminating Chunk Loading Round Trips with Universal SSR. And with that, I will just turn it over to you. Great. Let's share my screen and make sure that this is going to work correctly. Um, Can you check the chat for everybody? Uh, yeah. Everybody. I will. Yeah. And your screen looks good. So you're good. good. Yep. Are you seeing WebStorm right now? Uh, I can't see what I'm sharing. Oh, no, you're seeing Slack for some yeah, reason. Seeing, yeah. That's the wrong screen then. Ah, desktop two. Somehow I clicked desktop one. There we, there we go. I was like, no. okay. Um, okay. So that title was a bit of a mouthful. Uh, what that means is, so when we're doing Angular, when we're writing Angular applications, everybody's familiar with this, you know, import. Also, is this big enough? Should I make this bigger? Maybe Somebody, it's, it's, it's okay, maybe. but put a little, it'd be good. Okay. I'll go up to 22. Um, is that better? Okay, so um, we're all familiar with this import keyword here. Uh, we use it for, typically we use it for lazy loading, you know, child routes uh, when routing. Um, but this isn't an Angular construct. This is just a JavaScript construct. It's called a dynamic import. Um, and we can use it in a lot of different cases. Um, theoretically, you can lazy load nearly everything. Uh, I know there's been some community members talking about this recently where you can lazy load, say, a service. And that service ends up in a completely different chunk. And you only pull that chunk down when you use the service, for example, right? So this code right here, what we're what we're doing here is when this app component loads, um, we're dynamically importing this log file. So that's log.ts. It just has a log function that logs, I am a log. The actual functional code doesn't matter, but we're dynamically loading that, which would then pull the bundle down that has that log.ts compiled JavaScript in it. Um, and then it's a promise because it has to asynchronously load it, right? And then we're calling the log function. So what the Angular compiler does do though, is it takes that dynamic import and says, okay, this file doesn't need to be included in my main bundle or my vendor bundle or my runtime bundle or any of the other bundles, right? Because I might not always be called. So it ends up in a completely separate bundle. So um, in this case, uh, it has some random name because, you know, the Angular compiler makes their names really long, but it's essentially log ts dot javascript dot js, right? So what's going to happen here, and we're going to actually pull up a web browser to look at this, is 
we have this application. This is running an SSR. We're going to get to the SSR part here pretty quick. But on load, uh, we print I am log. I am a log. That is because in the constructor, we are dynamically importing it. Once it's imported, we then call the log function on it. Um, so what's happening here? On page load, you can see, you know, classic, we're, we're loading the runtime bundle, the polyfills, the vendor, the main. Um, this is just, don't worry about that. This is the one though. This app, it's this is the log TS JavaScript file. This has our function code in it, right? So imagine we were doing this for, say, 30 small bundles, right? Uh, on page load, we're like, We've, we have this really, really great chunking algorithm, right? And we're chunking up all these tiny different little pieces of code. What happens now is now on page load, your app might load really quick initially, but now it needs to make a request for all of these different pieces of code, right? And now you are now you have this round trip time for every single piece of code. Like, do we really want a whole network fetch round trip for a function that says console log, I am a log? Probably not, right? So what we can do is uh, use what's called an import map. So um, import maps are, they go into a script tag um, and they kind of say like, hey, browser, if you were to import this, instead use this value. So we can kind of give it the app, we can give it this code here. We can give it this, this log code so that when it goes to pull down this chunk, it's like, oh, I don't actually need to pull down the chunk. I already have the code accessible because it's in the script tag. But with Angular, how does that work? Um, because, you know, all we're doing here is calling this dynamic import function. Um, this all gets transpiled with Webpack anyway. So we're kind of like, we're going to kind of hack Webpack a little bit and kind of intercept one of its require calls. But anyway, we'll get to that. So right now we're calling this. We're, we're pulling this whole chunk down here. If we use... I, I, I built this library for it. Um, we're going to just see it working in action and then kind of delve into just exactly, you know, what exactly it's doing. But if we enable this, it is going to recompile. Now what happens is, so we still have I'm a log. It's still working correctly. But in our network tab, instead we have this, which is, instead of requesting a URL, it's just getting back the actual value of that file now. So it's act not it's not actually making a request to a server to get the function log that logs I am a log. It's just getting the JavaScript. It's kind of like a uh, it's just the, the actual value of the file itself, right? So response, you can see here's our function, right? But we didn't actually make a network request for it. And now, how does that work? So if we go into our head tag, we can see we have this script tag here. Um, uh, it's type module. We don't really need to worry about that. Uh, and then we have this import. Where's the, why does it not open? There should be a script tag somewhere with the value in it. Am I just completely missing it now? Weird. Um, this this is the import map, but now for some reason it's not showing us the actual value of it. We'll get that in a second. It, it'll be fine. But we saw it working. So the actual JavaScript. This is the this is the trouble with doing live coding. I like to live dangerously. I'm not like, too much of a presentations guy, but we know it's working. Honestly, not sure why it's working, but we're gonna actually do this with some components um, and some lazy loaded routes and stuff like that here pretty quick. So we'll see we'll see it work better in a second. So anyway, all that to say, we are now not needing that whole round trip back to the server to actually get that um, piece of JavaScript code, right? So that, that's great because our SSR application is actually being served with the pieces of the application that it was rendered with so that we don't need to load the SSR page and then make a bunch of requests out to the server to get all these tiny little chunks just so that we can um, now with Angular 16, hydrate our app, right? Because to be able to hydrate the app, we need all of the app code. So let's do this a little bit more complexly now. So 
we have this path, right? This is just a basic router path. We're loading, you know, level zero component. If we go to level zero component, we're loading level one, go to level one, we're loading level two, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to level 10. And this is kind of where it ends. So now we're just loading this one, right? So if we pull up our browser now, you can see, maybe you can't see that. Um, here's all the routes, right? Our root, level zero, level one, all the way down to level 10, right? We didn't actually have to make a network request for any of these chunks of the application. They're all just JavaScript that was served with the actual page load itself. So our application says, hey, here's the rendered page. I know I used this JavaScript. So I'm gonna send this JavaScript with me so that you don't need to go and fetch it yourself when you go to hydrate on the client side. So that saves you, well, in this case, you know, 10 or 11, I guess, because index zero, 11 round trips back to the server. So you get that initial index.html with the SSR value in it. And so that's one, that's one server call, right? And then you would have run times to polyfill vendor main, and then you'd have 11 more for all those pieces. We reduce this down to five, right? So let's see if our import map is working correctly now. Hopefully it is, um, or at least it, hopefully it's showing correctly anyway. Um, so I think this has changed since I did this originally, unless uh, I don't have use source. Um, I think somehow it is displaying differently than when I originally built this package forever ago. I probably should have checked this when I went to go before doing this, but now they're all gone. That's so weird. <laughs> this is supposed to be. Okay, so, this, so, this is what happens when you do live presentations. This is exactly what happens. Yep, exactly. This is like You're a good. script with type import map at the top. Is that what it is? It's weird. It's supposed to be a JSON object. Oh, oh, maybe it's this one. Ah, Chow, you're a genius. Okay, we're cruising, everybody. We're cruising. Um, so this is our import map. It's going to be like, it's hard to format it, but it's essentially just a JSON object that says, here's the imports. Right. Oh, let's not do that. Here's the imports. And then if you ever go to import something in browser, if you go to import, you know, this chunk, well, here's the JavaScript for it. And then, you know, if we scroll down somewhere, all of those chunks exist in this import map. So your initial page load just contains all of the JavaScript you need to actually render your application. Um, now the browser allows it to um uh you don't need to provide an import map for everything uh the the library does allow you to configure that um but in this case we're just dynamically importing and providing in the import map literally everything um a couple of questions this might be a dumb question is using the import map can be considered as a form of resumability and if not how does it differ so no I wouldn't necessarily call this resumability um, just because resumability typically is referring, it, at least in the, you know, the current sense of the word, uh, say like with quick, um, you know, what Mishko is working on, we're resuming the actual application itself, like what's inside the DOM, right? This is just um, preventing you, this is just loading the JavaScript of your application in a different way. It's not actually resuming the state of the application, right? That's what that's what Quick does is it resumes the state of the, it serializes what state the application was in when it was served. Um, you can kind of do this with Angular, but it's not really resumability. It's more hydration if you use like the, the transfer state and stuff like that. Um, but the Angular team's working on all that kind of stuff. So hopefully that answered the question. Um, the second question here, import map is viewing the import, but I guess in the way you're using import, not actually sure what that is saying. If you want to clarify in the chat, then I can I can work on addressing that. So anyway, we have our import map. It's working. We're saving ourselves 11 network requests to go get all these tiny little chunks, right? Yes. So the, the, the trade-off that we all need to consider here is that um, you are increasing your initial bundle. 
size, right? So I probably wouldn't be loading, you know, like a five megabyte JavaScript file into an import map, for example. Like don't import map your vendor.js file. I don't think that would be a good idea. This is just trying to eliminate the round trips for all those tiny little files and stuff like that, right? Just by kind of inlining them into the into the code uh, to prevent that. So how does this work? So what we're doing actually is we're intercepting the way that Webpack is loading these chunks. So when when we go to load one of these chunks, Web, Webpack has this uh, like require function, Webpack require. Um, it's called underscore underscore Webpack underscore require underscore underscore. So this is this is an object in in the actual compiled bundle um, of Webpack that has all these different methods on it. Um, I think it's dot e is the one that actually does the requiring of these bundles. So what we do is we have this provider, provide chunk preloader, which will be used in our um, app server module, or if you're bootstrapping um, using standalone, uh, this would just be in the server providers array, which would be merged with the app providers, the, the, like the app config. Um, but it has an environment initializer that says when the app starts up before anything else is actually being required, um, we're going to save an original copy of this dot E function, right? Um, and then we're going to overwrite the dot E function with our own method. And this, what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to intercept each of the different chunks that do get dynamically imported. So this is how we can prevent our application from literally dynamic, like inlining every single JavaScript bundle or every single JavaScript module into our import map. We're only inlining into the import map, the ones that are actually used. So if anything gets imported with this webpack require.e function, um, we're going to then find its module ID, create a preload link for it, if it doesn't exist already, created all this kind of stuff, right? And then we're actually going to read the contents of the file um, from the browser version of the files. Because when you're building SSR with Angular, you end up with two different folders. You end up with your browser folder and your server folder. The browser ones are um, compiled to be run inside the browser. The server ones are obviously be compiled to run inside Node. Um, so you can't, you know, you can't use the Node ones in browser and vice versa, right? That's why there's a double, there's like a two-step process to render Angular applications. So we read the actual file contents of our JavaScript files and then insert a import map for them and say, okay, browser, if you go to import this file, instead just use this string of JavaScript. Um, and then afterwards, just so we don't actually break the application, we would call the web cap, webpack require E function normally, just so that we don't mess anything up. Um, because if we don't actually call the original function, nothing will end up being uh, required and then our application will work. The last little piece that I'll talk about here is that um, we have this, uh, we're providing an injection token for before app serialized. This is a server only uh, lifecycle hook of sorts for the, ang for the Angular application that says before you go to serialize the application to send it to the client, before you take this rendered version and send the SSR version, we're going to do something. And what we're going to do is we're going to call this serialize import map, which essentially just, this is what creates that import map tag that I wasn't able to find <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, so we're actually just going to create a script tag that's going to end up in the SSR version. And that's going to have the content of all of the JavaScript files that we dynamically um, uh, uh, imported. And then it's as simple as that. We just insert it first so that we make sure that if anything goes to load one of these files, we use it instead. Um, and then that's how we end up with this application where all of these files that are rendering all these 11 levels of routing deep don't need to make a network call for every single little bundle. Um, that's the 
pretty much the base concept of how we can eliminate uh, these round trip times when SSR in applications. The thing I'll note is that I haven't ever tested this in production. Um, it gets a little weird with trying to match module IDs, um, which is actually just like the, the file name, the, the unique ID of a JavaScript bundle um, between the browser and the server. If you're not using the exact same uh, optimization and build optimizer flags. So it gets a little weird. So we're actually running in a uh, development um, mode right now so that the, the hashing of the chunks is the same between the two. So it's easy to match up between the two because uh, you don't want to be like, you know, for example, loading level three's code when you actually want to load level one's code, right? So if you mismatch those, then you're going to cause problems in your application. This was more just a proof of concept to see if it was possible. Um, Maybe there's something here. Maybe there's not. Some extension points could probably be like provide a uh, uh, like a guard or a limit on only you know import map files that are less than twenty kilobytes or something like that. Just so you never end up um, you know import mapping the vendor file because that's probably not a good idea. Like I was saying before. Um, of course, of course, of course, it depends on every single one of um, your applications and your cases. And maybe there's a use case for inlining absolutely everything. If you have the best, you know, gzipping or compression strategy on the face of the planet, then all the power to you. Um, but yeah, that's renting round trip times by inlining JavaScript chunks to SSR applications or whatever the title of my talk was. I can't actually remember it because it was a mouthful. Um, definitely going to open it for questions though, because I know that was a lot to go through and I know I talk pretty quickly when I'm presenting. That was excellent. Thank you. Mouthful or not? I think it was awesome. <laughs> Great. But, and I, I am actually going to throw a little bit of an unusual wrench in here because normally we do like a good, you know, five, 10 minutes of Q and A, but because mm -hmm. we're, we're, putting in four talks tonight. We're going to hold a lot of them off. I think we have time to do, it looks like we have two in there. So we'll I, I think I answered those. Did you? Okay. I answered them during the chat. Yeah. The one I wasn't okay. sure. So I said, okay. if you have more context, type it out. But the first one I did answer. Yeah. Okay. I remember that. Okay. So then, yeah, it looks like if you do have questions for him, because I would agree, like, I think there's lots of great content here to ask about, but let's hold all of our questions off till the end. And then we can just do like a, a like a open question, you know, kind of round table discussion with all four of our speakers. And yeah, we'll just kind of go from there. But yeah. Jay, I have to apologize. So I did not really introduce you and I feel really bad. So. <laughs> no, <it's okay. laughs> well, let's let's do that really quick. Let's okay. And and I'd love to give you a chance to to talk about because you are a co-founder of a company called Trellis. So can you tell us a little bit about what Trellis is, what you do? Yeah, so we're an all-in-one fundraising tool for charities and nonprofits. We're trying to help charities um, become more sustainable and diversify their revenues so that they don't need to rely on, well, essentially charity of others to be able to run their operations and you know make a bigger impact in the world. So our guiding philosophy is that um, it's a lot harder to make an impact on the world as a single person or a single charity. But if we can help thousands of charities all at the same time, then our impact is just exponential across across the whole world. So that's our guy. That's what we try to do here, Charles. I love it. And I know you did some really good things during COVID as well. So mm -hmm. good things. But and then tell us also, because you know, one other thing about you, you're an Angular GDE, got mm -hmm. all this great experience, but something that's on your your profile that I'm not familiar with is the this is learning so tell us about that as well yeah so that was something that was started by um Lars and Santosh uh they do a podcast uh, we haven't done one in a little while but we usually bring on guests to talk it's not just Angular specific um we talk about pretty much anything tech related we talk yes. we bring in people to talk about community um DevOps you know databases new cool fancy products for developers, pretty much anything. Um, and yeah, just trying to introduce some more people to some more stuff. And I think 
I know, I know there's been some people that I've talked to regularly on there, but I've been a part of quite a few episodes now, so I can't exactly remember. Awesome. That's yeah. Yeah. I love podcasts like that. So, Hey, well, cool. Thank you. Thank you. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll have you hang out and then answer some questions at the end, but sweet. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, Chow just had the one here, not really a question, but can you show the demo with enabled false to see what we actually save? Yeah. One here. I'll do it really quick here. Awesome. So we had this initially, but we were only loading the log one. So if we have enabled false, so enabled false, we're just, we're not lazy loading or we're not import mapping anything. Um, if we go back here, then we see all these different HTTP calls. So my screen's like kind of small right now, but we, there we go. See now all of these chunks are actually making round trips to the server to be able to get that JavaScript. Yeah. Whereas you before. Can, yeah. And you can actually see the, the waterfall there. As well. Yeah. Up here. Right. Yep. That's awesome. So do, 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 do all like that. Right. And yeah. if we change it back to true, that doesn't happen because the browser literally already Correct. has the JavaScript needed. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So that's it. Okay. Kale, stop sharing now. <laughs> no, you're good. Thank you. And then Steve, you, you want to introduce Chow for us? Sure. Thanks, Jay. That was super interesting. And I actually can't wait to watch that again. <laughs> we, we will be posting these talks on the Angular Community Meetup YouTube channel. I just posted that in the chat. I'm not sure what the timing is. Maybe that's a week or two until those get up. It's like two or three weeks, yeah. Okay. And so next up is Chow Tran. He's a senior engineer at Narwhal, an Angular GDE, creator of Angular 3, a contributor to Nest, proud father and spouse. And I also believe you occasionally live stream on Twitch or YouTube. Um, before we get going, though, if you don't mind, can you share what is your current favorite guilty pleasure? Yeah, well, since we, uh, uh, by the way, thank you, Steve, for, for the introduction. Uh, well, since we uh, mentioned Starbucks, I'm going to throw out my favorite Starbucks drink. It is, uh, it's, it's cheap too. <laughs> it's a uh, iced quad espresso in a venti cup with whipped cream and two pumps of white mocha. Oh, nice. It's a mouthful, but it's good. Put the extras on there, right? Yeah, is uh, it has a cake in the morning it's, since it's quad espresso. So, uh, and it's cheap because I mean, you you ask them to put in a venti cup, so a little bit more ice, uh, and yeah, keeps me awesome. going. <laughs> okay, well, buckle up, everyone, for Chow's talk: cracking, cracking the Angular custom renderer. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, share. All right, you guys see my screen? You should see the uh, presentation. Yes, looks good. Okay, sweet. All right, let's start. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, today we're gonna, I'm gonna attempt to 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 show you how to crack the Angular renderer. So. so Again, uh, Steve's already introduced, but I have this slide here. So my name is Chow, and uh, I have my Twitter and GitHub on the screen. So if you have any questions at all, because we're going to be moving a little bit faster uh, since we have a limited time, <clears throat> feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Uh, my DM is open. So uh, if you oh, have any questions. Chow, to... Can I actually throw in something there is that we have our channel on the Angular Discord. So if anybody has questions yeah. after tonight, just go on to the Angular Community Meetup Discord channel. And hopefully we can, you know, as a community, if, if our speakers aren't able to be there, at least as a community, I think we can help answer questions. But yeah, for sure, meet us there. Yeah, if you can, uh, if you can find a way to get a hold of me, uh, get a hold of me and uh, I will try my best to answer your questions. So what is Angular Renderer? Now, uh, a little disclaimer. If you have watched this presentation before on Angular Air, uh, this is a shorter version of it. The perk of this presentation is that you, you hear me live, so you can ask questions. Uh, Angular Renderer is a very niche uh, topic that probably doesn't serve you on like a, like a daily basis like as an Angular developer. However, there's some like, technical details in this presentation and in the demo. So I hope you learn something. 
uh, the concept of the Angular renderer is very basic. It's, it's very easy. Uh, the hard part is the, how to create one that is efficient and how to use one is tricky. So uh, let's get down to it. But to answer this question, what is Angular renderer? Uh, we have to understand the distinction between the platform and the Angular core. So if you open up your man.ts file right now in your Angular application, 95% of the time, you're going to see Angular platform browser. You're going to have to import something from it. And uh, what you're importing is the bootstrapping logic. So Angular core on its own doesn't do anything related to your application. The, the platform is what provides that bridge, the renderer to bridge between the Angular core and the platform that you're working with. So you, you, you will see bootstrap application or platform browser for ng module. Sorry, I don't remember, uh, but that's the logic. So that's the renderer is the bridge. So what I have here is a very simple component, uh, an app component. And a template is just a diff with some text inside of it. And then there's this uh, like app parent. So we render some parent component. Well, I don't know why I call this parent probably at the time parent makes sense, but uh, doesn't matter in this context. So that template, so that's component template. It's gonna go through uh, the Angular compiler, uh, which spits out uh, the, oh, sorry, the template instructions. And uh, when I talk about template instructions, I mean the IV engine template instructions. So go back Angular 8, Angular 9, there's a blog post on Angular of IV. So if you read that, you will understand template instructions. And we, uh, we're gonna like dive uh, into one of them. And then these template instructions called the renderer, which finally interacts with the platform. So in other words, that you, you, you can kind of think of the renderer as the bridge between your template and the platform that your application is running on. You can kind of shrink the diagram down to just Angular core on one side, the platform on the other side, and the renderer in between. Now, this makes the Angular core uh, platform agnostic. So you can have like native script, right? So native script has their custom renderer uh, to render the uh, template to the native uh, platform. All right, so this is where we get into the technical details. This is the same app component, uh, but it is compiled. This is the compiled code of the app component. And we're gonna focus on the template part again. So this is the template from the template string that you wrote uh, or the template URL if you're using uh, a separate file for your HTML. This gets compiled to a function and we call it template function. A little aside, this template function accepts RF, uh, which stands for uh, right here, RF, which stands for random flags, which is a big topic for another day. And then it receives something called CTX, which stands for context. So context is the component instance. So as you know, when you take a component tag and you render it multiple times, each time is a component instance. So the template function, we only have one template function. The template function needs to know which component instance that it's working with. So that's the little aside. Now back to this. So uh, there's something that I want to emphasize right here when, you, when we write this template string. So when we wrote the div and some text inside of it, we subconsciously refer this div uh, to the HTML div element. But if you look down to the template function, uh, specifically the element start instruction, the div here is just a string, right? There's no indication to tell the template function to tell Angular core at this point. That's div refers to HTML div element. Same thing with app parent, right? At this point, there is no indication to tell Angular core that app parent refers to the parent component, right? So uh, what's going on? 
Now let's take a closer look at element start. So this is the, the code of element start inside of Angular core. And this is, I believe, Angular 15. So Angular 16 is, is a little bit different. Uh, I checked right before the presentation. <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit different. I didn't have time to update it, but uh, it's very similar. So element start is a function that it does something in the beginning and then it gets the renderer from somewhere. Uh, that somewhere is again, another topic for another day. If you have questions about all of these tidbit that is skipped, uh, feel free to hit me up and I will uh, go into uh, deeper with you. It will call create element node, right? It passing that name. Again, that's the diff string. Create element node finally calls into renderer.createElement. This, this, does this look familiar to you? I bet it does to you, Jay. You just used it inside of your library. Well, it is similar to document.createElement, right? So if you have created HTML element dynamically before, model dialogue script tag, you're probably using document.createElement. And at this point, the renderer is kind of like an abstraction that Angular provides for different platforms to provide the actual implementation of this API so that it can interact with the platform, with the renderer. And now at this point, now only at this point that Angular core knows that div refers to HTML div element. In addition to creating element, which is the element start uh, instruction, we do have property binding we have attribute binding, which is not really binding. Attribute is all static constants, but I, I like to keep it consistent. Um, and then we have event binding. All these three are very, very basic concepts for uh, an Angular developer to know. We use it all the time, right? And to reflect that, I update the diff a little bit. So we have, we have property binding, attribute binding, and event binding syntax. And we have the updated compile code, right? Let's bring that template back. The attribute binding gets put into the const array. Const sounds, sounds like something constant, static. It makes sense, right? Because attribute is always static. Uh, next, we have the event binding, which spawns a new instruction called listener. And this listener does something and it will ultimately call the context on click, which is the on click function uh, or method on the component instance. Last but not least, we have the property binding, which is another instruction function called property. And it calls with the ID, which is the property that we want to buy. Um, and then the uh, title uh, property on the uh, component instance. That's it. That is the renderer. That is the renderer. Create element, set property, uh, property binding, uh, attribute binding, event binding, and there's more. But uh, that's the the top like most basic four that we have to understand about the renderer. Now the hard part and the interesting part is to create a custom renderer. So to create a custom renderer, we need a renderer factory too. I don't know why it's two. That's the renderer factory one, but I never used it. And then you need a renderer two. All right, so time for demo. All right, so for the demo, I kind of prepare uh, a simple Angular CLI application with some code here to prove about the platform. So the Bootstrap application is from Platform Browser. Most dev developers just kind of like, oh, generate a new application and then start working on the application. So they don't look into it. So we have the Bootstrap logic from the platform, which provides a renderer for the browser platform. Uh, oops. Then we have the app component. And this app component, I'm rendering the app canvas component. The app canvas component renders some canvas get a reference to that canvas, inject the service, and then start something with the uh, canvas element. And then uh, look at this. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna be using three JS, uh, which is um, the, the topic for today as well, is I have this code. So this code is actually, 
uh, from uh, a documentation uh, from a 3JS website. I literally just copy this block of code and I paste it in my uh, start method in my service. So I create some scene, creating some camera, creating some renderer with that canvas element, creating some object, add that object to the scene and then run the animate function, like start an animation loop, right? So um, that is the uh, component at the moment. And I have the, uh, the application running. So let's go see it. So this is what we're seeing right now. This is what we're rendering. And uh, we look at this, we have the canvas, right? We have the app canvas, canvas, and we have the animating cube, right? Not very exciting, but uh, let's look at the canvas service again. So to use 3JS in Angular Catalyst today, or originally, this is what you have to do. Um, you just new up uh, 3JS objects and then follow 3JS documentations or like APIs to set up your scene graph. What I want to do though, is I want to be able to say, hey, under app canvas, whatever the app canvas is, I want to say, I want a mesh, right? I want a mesh, which is a 3JS object. I want this mesh to have a box geometry, which is the cube. And I want to have this mesh, I want this mesh to have some material, right? Which is the texture of this mesh. I want to be able to do this. Right? And without having to import like mesh component, like box geometry component, all that stuff. Why? Because 3JS is a, like a fast moving library. They, 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 spit, um, they release new, fee, uh, new um, versions very frequently. And to have a component wrapper libraries for 3GS is, is very painful for maintainers. So we have to look if, um, at this from a different approach. So that approach is a custom renderer. So we kind of know that the custom renderer interact with the template. So what if we can say, hey, if you see a mesh, do something. If you see a box geometry, do something with it, all right? So I'm gonna just comment that out for now. And let's start with create a custom renderer. So to create a custom renderer, again, you need a yeah. render. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry, can you just make the text a little bit bigger for us? The font size? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, size, 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 there we go. So let's uh, go 30. There we go. All right, uh, should we good? Good enough? Let me know if, it's, uh, if I need to go bigger. Good? I think so, yeah. Let us know in the chat, everybody. Oh, okay, bigger. all right. Oh, no, but she's saying bigger in the browser too, please. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and you can you can see this cube, right? It, it, yes. There's no point in making this bigger, to be honest. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Let's get back to this. So we need like a renderer factory too, uh, and this is an injectable, so you can inject stuff into it. So here I inject the DOM renderer factory too, which is provided by the platform browser. Why do I want to have this? Because um, what I want to do is I want to render to WebGL or the canvas, which still on the browser. So I still kind of use the, uh, the, 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 the browser platform. So I want to inject the current DOM renderer so I can delegate stuff that I don't handle to this DOM renderer. I inject my canvas service, right? And then I have to uh, have a create renderer function that returns an instance of a renderer too. And here I just pass in that renderer uh, from the DOM renderer, which is I call delegate. And then I pass in the canvas service. And this is the renderer uh, API. I put five top most important and things that we talked about on top. And then the rest is just delegate, delegate. So things still work, right? So now we have the renderer factory and then we have the renderer. Let's actually use it. So to use the renderer, uh, you have three places to provide your custom renderer. The first place is the uh, provider's array when you bootstrap. 
So you can provide the renderer factory, factory to and use use class with the child renderer factory. The second place is route provider. So you can actually provide different provider, uh, different renderers for different routes. So think about it. Let it sink in a little bit. Document route, render markdown, uh, graph, render D3, right? Think about it a little bit. Um, the third place is when you use create component or uh, view container ref. So view container ref dot create component to create or to render a component dynamically. So you can actually create that component and use a custom renderer just for that component tree. So all the children of that component has that. Now think, of it, think about it a little bit more, right? You have graph component, you have like document component, markdown component, what have you. So those are the three places. For the purpose of this talk, I just use the providers array in the bootstrap application. So I'm gonna go, um, the app compiles. I'm gonna go back to the uh, application still running. Now let's prove that we're using the custom renderer. So if you remember, create element is something that element start uses, which is like the first point that the Angular core interacts with the renderer. So if I put some locks in here, I should see it. So I'm gonna put lock, create element with the uh, name. I'll go back here and voila, I do see my app canvas which is the things that I'm rendering and the canvas element, which is what the app canvas is rendering. Great. All right, so now let's go back to uh, app canvas component. Before I forgot, before I forgot, let's put the star out and put the init inside. Now the star is just some, something for demo, but the init is we create the renderer we set the some position and then we run the animate function outside of Angular Zone. So that's the init function. Now let's get back to uh, app component, right? I want to put some 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 tag in here, some custom tag in here. We are Angular community meetup, right? So I'm gonna just say ngc and I say mesh, mesh, and I want this to have box geometry and ngc uh, mesh basic material. Right now, Angular's, uh, Angular compilers yells at me because they don't know or it doesn't know what NGC mesh means. And yeah, it's not a component. So this is one downside of using custom renderer is that you have to opt into the custom element schema. Custom element schema. So now the error, go the error is gone, app compiles, and we have some more stuff uh, from the create element logs. So now we have these three, we can handle it. So go back to the renderer. We're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna grab the three name, which is if it starts with NGC, then I will slice the first four characters. Uh, and then if and not just name, then I will grab the three constructor from the three namespace. Uh, I'm gonna say uh, three as any for now, three name. And we're going to import it and we'll kind of console log the three constructor real quick. Let's save that, get back here. And you can see that I can actually access the, the mesh class constructor from three namespace. So like we can say, if we have it, we're going to return the instance of that. So I'm going to save and we're going to see some error. So the problem is that uh, now we're returning something that is not a DOM element. And the renderer using the append child to, to, to append stuff to the parent, right? When you have like content child, like the canvas, ng content, all of that is using the append child from the renderer to do it. And right now we're using the delegate, which is the DOM renderer. It doesn't know how to uh, handle three JS object. So we can console lock right here with uh, append with parent and new child, right? We see that it errors when it sees mesh as a parent and box geometry as a new child. 
So now this is something that we can handle. So let's handle it. All right, so we say, hey, if the parent is an object 3D, this is a 3GS implementation details. You just know that this is the way to check if uh, an object is an object 3D. And we say, hey, if a new child is a, a geometry, then we say that. Else if new child is material, we say parent of material equal new child. And then we want to return from it. So we don't want to get it to, uh, we don't want to get to the renderer, uh, the delegate. Right. We say that we still have error, but we get a little bit further. Now we get to the part where the parent is the canvas element, a DOM element, and the new child is a three object. So we need to handle this case a little bit different. Right? So we're going to handle it right here. We say, hey, if the parent is an instance of the HTML canvas element, we're going to recall the append child with the scene, the root scene object from the canvas service and with a new child. Now we return. I'm gonna save and we go back here. We're not seeing anything uh, yet. Uh, let me see why. Uh, append child canvas component net, save that. App component, NGC mesh. Actually, let's see the renderer. Uh, canvas service the scene. Oh, oh, we forgot to do this one thing. Right now, uh, when we uh, when we call a pen child with a scene and a new child, the new child is the object three D. So we need to say, hey, if new child is object three D, we do parent dot add new child, and this is need an else if here. All right. So now I saved. And go back. Now we see that uh, that mesh on the scene, and we look into uh, the element or the DOM tree. We don't see that anyway because we render directly to the canvas, right? Were we missing something? Do we have time? Do we have five more minutes uh, to? We, we're gonna do the property binding, the attribute binding, and the uh, listener, the event binding, right? So we're now the cube is uh, white. We want to give it a color, right? So if we look back to the canvas service, this is the code from um, uh, 3GS. It gives the color to the cube via the material, which makes sense. The material is the texture. So we're gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna go to app component. I'm gonna say, hey, I want to give this color, um, I don't know, maybe red for angular. All right, I'm gonna save and I'm gonna see some error, right? It's saying, hey, set attribute is not a function. Right, uh, so we call into the set attribute now for attribute binding. And we're still using the delegate, which is a DOM renderer, and it cannot handle three JS object. So we say, hey, if this is a material, grab that name, which is the color string, the, the uh, attribute name, and just set the value. And we're gonna, hard, we, we, we hard code something here to make it work. So now with that four lines of code, now I have the red cube, right? That's exactly what we set on the template. So here, if we say, hey, I want a, a different one, and it works. All right, so that attribute binding. Now let's next is property binding. So what I want to do is I want to move the cube to a different position. Maybe we want to move it to the right a little bit. Uh, so on the mesh, we want to say, I want to buy to position with an array of uh, X, Y, and Z. And this is, what, uh, this is what I'm saying, move this cube, uh, move this mesh 1.5 point unit to the right of the X axis. And we save. Again, we're gonna see error because it's tried to call the set property and it cannot handle, the DOM renderer cannot handle three object. All right, so we'll go back to the renderer, go to the set property. We say, hey, if you are uh, an object 3D, Grab the name and set with the value. And here again, we hard code something. We say that, and now the cube is moved. Last one is the uh, animation, right? So animation, we have a lot of approach uh, approaches for this one, but I want to do something that is familiar to the Angular uh, developer, which is an 
uh, an event binding. What event? We're gonna call this before render. Uh, why before render? Because to animate something in 3GS or basically uh, animate something on the web, you would change property of that um, object bit by bit by bit by bit, and then you call the render function in an animation loop so that you like you move it little 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 by little by little by every frame so it's almost like a like a stop motion um movie or animations and we we change we have that logic before the render so we call it before render and we're going to buy this to on before render and just have that right there um now back to the renderer uh, we're going to handle that with the listen. So we're going to say, hey, if the target is an object 3D and if the event name is the before render, we're going to use the, uh, the canvas service animations, which is a map. We're going to set the target dot UUID and we're going to assign a, a callback function to it. And we're gonna call the callback. This callback is the handler that you are calling from your component. So this is uh, the callback. And I'm gonna give it the target. So it call, gives you back the, uh, the, the, the target. And then the listen function returns a cleanup function. So you have to clean up your uh, event. So what we can do is say, hey, animation.delete the target of UID. Uh, animation is the map, and I just like loop over this map and call the callback uh, for each uh, for each callbacks. All right, so now I'm gonna uh, target, not target, target. All right, and now my my before render actually running uh, to solve this, uh, to show that I'm gonna console log here, and you can see that it's running on every frame. All right, so now how do we get the, uh, the mesh inside of here? Two ways. First is we actually pass back the event, right? Which is the, uh, the target or the mesh. Another way is we can use the template variable. Uh, one advantage of using the custom renderer is that you can leverage Angular core. Like this is grabbing the, an instance of this element. And because we return the mesh object, so this mesh template variable is actually that mesh instance. So I'm gonna just pass in mesh. And here I say, hey, mesh. Uh, I'm just gonna say any because if I put three dot mesh, uh, Angular compiler is gonna yell at me because of typing. So I'm gonna use any. And I'm gonna say rotation.x, one, and y. Save, moment of truth. So now we have that working. So we cover property binding, syntax, uh, event binding, and attribute binding with a custom renderer. How cool is that? All right, one last thing before I go is why, why do this? Well, so you can now have another one declaratively on a template, give it a different um, variable, move it to a different place, reusing your uh, handler, and give it a different color. Now you have two cubes, right? And not just cubes, you can have a donut with a different geometry. After you eat the, the donut, you might feel a little bit weird. So let's grab some capsule. Now you have a capsule, but it looks planned. They look planned, right? You can put in some light, uh, spotlight. I want to put in a plus spotlight and I want to put this at five, five, and five. I want to put a point light. Uh, all right. Uh, there we go. And I put it like right opposite of the spotlight. So, so I think this mic is my object. I have three, two lines uh, pointing down from the opposite sides. Right, and now I'm gonna to have to change the material because the basic material is a material that cannot reflect lights. So I have to change this to a standard material. And this one is like a different material. Save that. And now you have 3D objects. And that is my presentation. And sorry, I went a little bit long. I try my best. <laughs>
<laughs> well, we're all over here just saying how our minds are blown. So that you are always just so impressive. And I feel like there's a million things to learn. What I love about your presentation, Zo Chow, is how inspired I get. And maybe everybody agrees with this, but like I watch you and I go, oh my gosh, I have a lot to learn. And it, it does. It makes me feel like pumped and excited that, you know, this is where I can keep going and growing. So always love to watch you and you're just so fast and it's fun to to be here but yeah i gotta learn how to reuse a keyboard apparently right <laughs> i know holy shit it's, that was it's insane. insane yeah that's that's one thing that i have going for me i'm pretty good at like uh, live coding <laughs> well it's fun so okay and then everybody we do have let's see chow why don't you take one of those questions and then we'll hold the other two until okay. Uh, why is element start spelled with three E's instead of one E? That is not E. That's actually like some theta uh, symbol, uh, which is an angular way of saying this is a private uh, API. Don't touch it. Because they can change the uh, the implementation of this instruction at any time. And to, to expand a little bit further, so when you create like Angular library and you are... Uh, recommended to use the compilation mode of partial, right? That's a full mode and that's partial mode. Uh, the reason why it is recommended to use partial is because when in partial mode, the uh, ng packager will compile your library into IV partial. It will leave out all of those IV instructions so that when the Angular application that consumes your library, it will spit out the correct version of those instructions for you so that your Angular library is not tied to a specific Angular version. So that's the reason. So always use partial, even though that's full. Uh, unless, unless you're in a monorepo, like say like an NX monorepo, because yeah. then you can safely, assuming assuming you're following a single version policy, you can make all of your Angular buildable libraries if you're using buildable or publishable libraries and mark them as compilation full because you know and you have full control over what version of Angular you're using in your repo. But that's an aside. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so uh, what's a delegate? So a delegate is just a name. It's just a name and say, hey, this is a renderer. I want to delegate uh, the operations that I don't want to handle. So you can see that uh, when I uh, when I check for if this is an object 3D, I only handle that case. Any other case, I delegate back to the uh, the the DOM renderer. So this is why I still have that canvas rendered on the on the DOM tree, and everything else is inside of that canvas. Uh, which Angular version are we using? We are actually using Angular 16. But uh, this, you can go back all the way to Angular 12, Angular 13, or actually anything that is Ivy. I don't know how this works in uh, View Engine. Awesome. Wow, we even got through all the questions. That's excellent. So, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And yeah, again, everybody, these are recorded. So like, you know, like me, you're hopefully going to need to go back and rewatch this, but we've got it recorded and it'll be on the ng-conf YouTube. But let's let's keep going. This is awesome. I'm excited for we've still got two more talks. So lots of good learning still to come. Marcus, you ready? Yes. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody, Marcus, if you don't know, he's one of our co-organizers here at the meetup. So I'm excited. Marcus is like seriously one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. Um, but on top of that, he's a very talented developer. He's a full stack dev actually at a company called, is it Consat Telematics? Am I saying that right? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Yep. And, and basically you guys are, you're, you're building the code that helps to manage fleet and traffic there in Sweden or what exactly do you do there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, um, we uh, build IT solutions for the public transportation sector. So uh, yeah, yeah. Um, like uh, traffic uh, management tools and fleet management tools. Uh, we have a, a good uh, customer uh, base here in Sweden and Norway and, and a fair a large uh, customer base in, in Canada as well oh, cool. and Australia. I yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> Seeing the phones up, yeah. <laughs> Basically yeah. all the cold so, countries except for Australia. 
Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. And then one other thing to mention is just that you do help organize TinyConf with a D. So your efforts are yeah. very appreciated with that. TinyConf is always a great time. But Marcus, we have to ask as well as everybody else before you, but what is your current favorite guilty pleasure? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've been thinking a little bit about it. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, the list goes on and on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I was thinking for it for a bit. Uh, I, I think one of the top ones right now it would probably be to to, to kind of kind of enjoy to watch Eurovision Song Contest. I'm not sure if if oh. most Americans uh, have have seen that uh, <laughs> competition, but it's like this um, music competition that goes on in in Europe, uh, and it's uh, it's, it's kind of weird. But but <laughs> and, I and I always be like, oh no, I, I have you heard about it? Well, I think it's we've heard of it, and there's even a movie that was made about it. I haven't seen it, but. Is it sort of similar to like, oh God, what's it called? Like um, America's Got Talent or something or like Angular Star. I can't remember what they're called. Is it similar to those? Yeah, I, I mean, I actually think they did. I mean, it's, I guess maybe it's more people here know about it than people actually in the US. But I think you guys did like an American song Possibly. contest. Okay. I think it was with like Snoop Dogg and some other host and... It was last year. I don't think it was a huge hit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Probably because only it, it's kind of weird, but but uh, yeah, no, I um, it it's it's countries um um it's pretty much all the European countries getting together and then they compete in like a music competition and and usually the songs is like it's kind of weird. It's like uh, I don't know if you say schlager, you know, if that's like a word, like a genre <laughs> that that you are aware of, but but that's like yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. But yeah, I, I saw the movie too. I love the, the movie. Okay. One too. Okay. Very oh, yeah. accurate. Yeah. <laughs> it was accurate. No, I, yeah. I mean, not, not far from, from, yeah. Okay. It was okay. fine. I'll have to check it out. But yeah, that's awesome. So <laughs> it's kind of the, the reality TV that, but those are fun because it's people sharing their talents. And I think it's always cool to see that. So good choice. Good yeah, choice. Yeah. But all right. <laughs> Well, we have you here. Your your talk title is pretty fun. It's the Puppet Master's Guide to Injection Tokens. So I will just turn it over to you and let's, yeah, let's learn as much if as I can share can. my screen. Okay. Let's see. Oh, and I do, while you're pulling okay. that up, I did want to just acknowledge, I keep mentioning the lightning talks, Lollapalooza. And it's kind of fun because we have, I've counted four of our speakers, actually five, including Chow, but we've got Blair, Learman, Craig Shearer, uh, Mateo, I'm sorry if I say your name wrong, but Tibaquira, and then Sanjita Santish Jos Joshi. Sorry if I say that wrong, but four of those speakers and then Chow. So again, come, come meet with us next month at the lightning talk Palooza downtown salt lake just the night before ng comp starts should be a good time for sure definitely i don't don't miss out uh let's see can, can you see my screen yeah looks great perfect all right so uh welcome to this talk on injection tokens in angular so Angular 16 was just released, and we are currently in a time where lots of exciting changes are happening to the framework. And this is why it's a great time to revisit and truly understand one of its core, most beloved, yet sometimes tricky features, dependency injection. And I used to feel frustrated when I had asked an Angular question on Stack Overflow. Uh, coming back to see that someone suggested me to use an injection token. Because it was often a completely valid answer, which was even more frustrating. Because here I was, you know, trying to avoid them because injection tokens, as well as the eye, was this rabbit hole that I had not yet explored. So that's why we're here today, to bring the elusive injection token into the limelight and demystify its role in the grand show of Angular. So after this talk, you will know the essentials of Angular dependency injection and injection tokens. 
the role of injection tokens in enhancing app flexibility and configurability, and hands-on usage of injection tokens in real-world scenarios. So quickly about me, I'm Marcus. I'm a software developer. I live in Gothenburg, Sweden, which looks something like this. And as the book mentioned, I'm also a co-organizer of this meetup. But a year ago, I did my first Angular Lightning Talk uh, at the Angular Community uh, Meetup uh, Lightning Talk Lollapalooza. And since then, I've, done, I've been fortunate to be a part of the two most recent Angular TinyConfs. And I'm thrilled to be back here today to talk about injection tokens. So let's kick off with some definitions. An injection token is a token utilized in a DI provider. But what is a DI provider? So before we delve into injection tokens, let's reiterate how a dependency injection works in Angular. So when we first encounter dependency injection in Angular, it often looks like this. We create a service class, which is essentially just a class with an injectable decorator. It is common to also provide a service in root, which means that it will be available at the root injector that is essentially in the entire application. An injector's primary role is to supply dependencies to those requesting them. And they come in two flavors, node injectors and environment injectors. We won't dig deep into them today, but Thomas Lafourche delivered a killer talk on a deep dive into the dependency injection system at Angular TinyConf last month, which I highly suggest you to check out on YouTube. So the beauty of the DI hierarchy lies in its flexibility. Dependencies can be provided at different levels, giving Angular its signature adaptability. So here we have a great grandchild component, which tries to resolve its dependencies, such as injected services, through the great grandchild node injector. And if the great grandchild node injector can't provide the great grandchild component with dependencies, the great grandchild component will take a step up the hierarchy now instead of asking the great, sorry, <laughs> the grandchild node injector for it to, to write its dependencies that it needs. And if the great grandchild component is persistent, it will just keep walking up the hierarchy until it manages to resolve the requested dependencies or die trying. You will see what that means in a bit. The root injector is a place where many dependencies are injected. Again, by setting root as the value to the provided in option in the injectable decorator. But services are not always provided in root and eventually will end up in the null injector. And we have all seen that dreadful null injector error a billion times as an Angular developer. We end up here when the requested dependencies were not found. So remember this hierarchy because it's a key tool in understanding and leveraging Angular's dependency injection system. And again, not, not to beat a dead horse, uh, but the provided in root can take you quite far as an Angular developer. It makes the service a singleton, tree shakeable, and available throughout the entire application. But yes, there are many other places where we can provide them. And depending on where they are provided, it will determine where they will be created and contained. So today we are going to work with our recipes app. The app consists of a landing page uh, and a recipes page. The, the recipes page contains a high level overview of all the available recipes. And by clicking on details, we can see the recipes in greater detail and each step that is required to complete them. And if we don't have any of the ingredients to any of the recipes, we can click on add to cart and then go to the checkout. So if we quickly see how the routes are set up, we can see that our recipe page uh, has an can activate that guards the route. And to determine whether or not we can navigate to that route, we inject our off service. Now, inject is a relatively new in the sense that it came out last year. It is available from Angular version 14, and it's essentially a new way of injecting dependencies. There are many benefits, something I won't really cover in today's talk, but 
we will favor the use of in inject function in front of the traditional constructor in injection. And if you're interested to learn more about the inject function, Camille Gallic did a really cool lightning talk on a couple of use cases with a new inject function at NGBE this year. So let's check out this providers array that we, that are the providers that we provide when we bootstrap our application. So we have the provide router, which is dependencies that our router needs to work as planned. Then we import the dependencies from the HTTP client module by using the import providers from method from Angular Core. Provide animations are providers that are used, yep, you guessed it, to perform Angular animations. And finally, uh, we have our own off service. So back to our route. So again, here we inject the off service where the off service will be retrieved from the provided off service that we added to the array in our application config. So we call the authenticate method and it returns an observable. And if the user is not authenticated, it will open an alert saying that the user is not authorized to see this page. So the happy case looks something like this. We just entered the view, nothing special. And if we're not authenticated, an alert will pop up and we'll be prevented from entering. So let's take a look at the providers quickly again. So when we add off service as an entry, in the end, it essentially gets expanded to a provider object looking something like on the right-hand side. So the provide field is a field that accepts a key and that will be the key that our component, the classes and whatnot um, can inject and use. So when we inject an off service key somewhere, it will look at the value that is provided to the use class. In this case, it's an off service and the injector will instantiate it and retrieve the service to whoever requested it. But the first time I saw this, I thought, you know, sheesh, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to write this out every time, you know, I'm glad I improved that developer experience, am I right? You know, because I thought, what, what's the point? If I wanted to use another service than off service, I would just have replaced the service. But sometimes there are situations where we are happy that we can use a different implementation than the service that we have injected in our entire application. So let's say you visit the recipes page and all is good, but what if you get tired of having to authenticate yourself every time? You know, all you wanna do is to style these cards, yet you have to log in every now and then, which can be tiresome. And what if, the backend authentication service that you use to authenticate users is temporarily not available, then what do you do? So that's when you pull up with the mock off service, essentially just replacing the implementation of the off service with something that implements the same exposed methods and variables. But in a way that doesn't perhaps require accessing the unavailable backend authentication service that's currently down. And in this case, it can be as simple as this. Simply just return true, wrap this an observable with the off operator. And this can also be an excellent approach when we want to test parts of our application that is dependent on services such as this. So by providing a mock service, we can focus on testing the behavior of the application that we want to test. So if we revisit this part again, the value of provide, our key field here is not limited to classes. It's typed to any as we can see, so we can really pr provide anything as a key. And services are not limited to classes either, actually. Use class will naturally instantiate the class, but use value will pass a value, use factory will invoke a function, and use existing will rather than create the dependency, simply try to retrieve an already instantiated dependency that is associated with a provided key. And in some, in some sense, it can be aware to provide uh, implemented service as a key and then use a different implementation as the value. And using a string or what else as a key is not that much better as there is no typing. So it would be really nice to inject a typed interface, but sadly we can't just inject a plain interface as interfaces are not kept when the TypeScript gets compiled down to JavaScript. But what we can do 
drum roll, please, is to use an injection token. So here we provide an app config key as an injection token. And then we use an appropriate value to configure, to configure the app. So here, it is just an object with a base URL field. But let's just take a moment and try to absorb this. So what is this hype all about? So well, rather than just injecting a particular implementation as the key, we just inject some expected behavior through our type token. And then the implementation is up for the user to decide. So essentially, we can use injection tokens around our app to be able to modify the app's behavior accordingly and even on different levels with the help of the Angular dependency injection hierarchy. So let's start out with one of the injection tokens that Angular provides for us that many of you already probably have come across. The HTTP interceptors token, it's used to intercept HTTP requests and can be great if we, for example, want to add, let's say, a beer token or something for every HTTP request we make. It's a multi-provider, meaning that we can set up multiple values associated with this injection token. So here we implement a class-based service. We name it token interceptor, and it implements the HTTP interceptor interface, which requires us to implement the intercept method. So we create a bear token with a value puppet master token. We clone the request, add our new header, and just pass it on. So if we then look into the networks tab in our Chrome developer dev tools while serving our application, we can see that our authorization header has been added. And as mentioned previously, we are not just restricted to using classes. So as long as we respect the interface of the HTTP interceptors injection token, we can just use a plain object instead that implements an intercept method. And again, if we check the networks tab in the Chrome developer tools, we can see that both our newly added HTTP headers are there. So yes, we don't really care about how it's implemented as long as it fulfills the contract, which is pretty cool. Now, let's check out the code quickly for this recipe card that we um, used to present a high level overview of a recipe. We can see here that there's a timestamp associated uh, with when the recipe was posted. So here we give our piped argument short, which will result in us using a particular formatting. And it looks good, but code-wise, it can be a little brittle approach, right? It, it invites trouble. It might not be a problem for us just yet, but as the app grows, it's easy to forget an optional input parameter uh, to a pipe. So being able to set a default date formatting behavior at a higher level would be really nice. And there is a way since Angular 15. So here, we use the date pipe default options injection token and set the date format to short. Now we don't have to provide any input uh, to the pipe and we have a desirable default behavior as we want it. Just beautiful. But what if we want to customize components in our app, but keep different customization in different parts of the app? So in the detailed view of the recipe, we are using a material stepper. There is a checkbox to determine whether or not the step has been completed. And Angular Material, being the brilliant component library it is, exposes many injection tokens to help us co uh, customize and configure the behavior of our app in many ways. As a default option, we might not want to show errors if we skip uh, a complete uh, a step in the recipe. Because maybe we want to take a sneak peek a few steps ahead to kind of anticipate what is coming up next. And showing errors uh, in a recipe might just be a little bit too aggressive in some sense. So now, if we find a recipe uh, exciting and we want to add the recipe's ingredients to the cart to purchase them, we enter a slightly different story. So here we want to make sure that we highlight the fact that the user has skipped the billing step somehow. And this is something we can do, right? The checkout component will first and foremost check its 
own injector for an dependency for the stepper global options. And since the checkout component will grab the first dependency of a token it finds, and if we register a different implementation of the stepper global options in the part of the app where the checkout component lives, it will go and grab and retrieve the confer this configuration instead. So here in our checkout component, we add a configuration value for our stepper global options and set show errors to true. And now when we add some items to our cart and we skip the billing, we can see that the math step label indicates that we have missed to complete the billing step. So to summarize, today we have clarified some core concepts of Angular's dependency injection. We have seen how injection tokens can dynamically alter an app's behavior. And we have looked at practical examples of using injection tokens for HTTP requests, pipes, and components. But your journey with Angular dependency injection and injection tokens does not, of course, stop here. The Angular documentation is getting finer every day, and there are some great guides over there that will take you far. The Coded Frontends playlist on dependency injection is one of my personal favorites. And of course, uh, Thomas Lafourche and Camille Gallic also have some great content, which I mentioned during the talk. Feel free to check out uh, the GitHub repo for the examples that was provided in today's talk. Uh, thank you to all the organizers, uh, the speakers, as well as all the attendees tuning in today. It's been a pleasure to speak at my favorite meetup. And please reach out to me if you want to continue this conversation on dependency injection. Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. That was awesome. Thank you. It's... Great, great to, great to to talk and share about this. My my favorite topic. The same same topic I introduced at my first talk here at the Angular Com Community Meetup. I guess at a more introductory level, and I guess that this was the the next step. So like, it's great to continue the the dependency injection journey. Yeah, I actually can't wait to watch that one again too. During this meetup, I'm I'm not really paying attention to the talks, but um, I did see the, <laughs> oh, the slides oh, yeah. were slides look awesome. They're sharp. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate. It. Um, do you want to take a question now or move on to Stephen's talk? Oh, wait, I don't see let's any see. Q and A, but um, okay. Yeah, I think let's just if anybody does have any, we'll just wait till the end, and then we can just move into Stephen. Okay, first I wanna say that I know most, most people aren't going to ng-conf, but for those of you who are, it looks like those four ng-conf channels are active on Discord now. Um, that's a thing that the people who go to ng-conf use to communicate if they're gonna like go out to dinner or, or anything that's happening during the conference. Last summer, I went to ng-conf for the first time and easily my favorite thing was beating and talking to some of the people who helped me learn Angular with their videos, blogs, and courses. One of those people is our next and final speaker for the evening, Stephen Cooper. Stephen is a senior developer at AG Grid. He's a talented blogger and content contributor, a triathloner, and a proud father of four. Stephen, um, you, I see you on the screen here. First, can you tell us what is your current guilty pleasure? I'm not. I'm not sure that he actually saw that. So, Stephen, we're, we've been asking each <laughs> of our speakers to share their current favorite guilty pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I I, I just logged in to hear about Eurovision. And I was like, yes, it's definitely <laughs> a guilty pleasure. There we go. That is definitely nice. something I approve of. Um, <laughs> You know, staying up really late to wait for those votes to come in. And the voting right. system is always very rigged, not rigged, very, um, I don't know, you know, it's some countries <laughs> vote for their favorite neighbor. And normally the UK does very badly, apart from last year where we actually, you know, came second. So that was a, that was a, a refreshing change. But yeah, no, I'm totally going to piggyback off and nice. say, you know, Eurovision is definitely yeah. a guilty pleasure. 
the so we had two Starbucks. Too. We had two Starbucks and two Eurovisions. I love it. <laughs> Get to pleasures. <laughs> Steve, what about you? What's one of yours? Well, at the moment, it's the NBA Finals Pro Basketball. Um, two of my favorite teams. Looks like they're going to be in the finals now. Okay. And when, when, see, I haven't been following. So who's in the finals? Um, Denver Nuggets are going to be there, and it looks like probably the Miami Heat. Okay. All right. So basketball, I'm going to, I'm going to swing in here, you guys, with a, a gaming one. I'm all about Jedi Survivor right now. If anybody has not played that game, you've got to play that game. It's just, it's fantastic. So I'm not, not so much the Starbucks person, but I can, I can give you some good Jedi tips. <laughs> okay, Stephen, let's hear your talk typing the not so secret to customization ng template outlet so you can see my slides just check yes yep looks great excellent oh giving away the surprise yes um so yeah i want to talk about my favorite topic of all um ng template outlets and you might be wondering why has it got such an odd title typing the not so secret to customization well what i'm doing here is referring back to 2019 where i gave this talk about ng template outlets um which was my first you know conference talk first time that i got to share something that i'd learned and for me ng template outlets both in the work that i was doing unlocked unblocked a lot of features um that i needed to do to make some really customizable and reusable components, as well as this talk then, you know, helping me and giving me the confidence to then start contributing back to the community. So if you want to learn about NG template outlets, a lot of the talk is still valid and it will give you a lot more in-depth motivation about why you might want to use it over some of the other approaches. But I'm not going to completely go into that, um, but I will give a quick overview about well, what is ng template outlet? Because if we don't know the feature, then you know it won't make sense why we're trying to type this. So ng template outlet is it's a really powerful tool for creating customizable components. And it, it kind of goes in three steps. Um, and we'll go through these with code examples in the next couple of slides. But what we do is we define a template in your app, and that may include these like let dash you know, syntax variables, which are template template variables. We take this template and we pass it to another component. And then that component, it receives the template and it renders it for us. And at the same time, it provides context to that template via something called ng template outlet context. Um, and that enables you to define your template in your application, but have it rendered within the context of a shared component um, in a way that you get to marry these two locations together. I think it'll probably be easier if we step through an example. So step one is that we define a template. So here we use the ng template um, element and we're saying we're gonna label it with this hash syntax and say it's an option template because we're gonna pass this to a list component. And here we've got these you know, let shark and let ID, um, which are these template variables. And we can see we're using those values within the template itself. So we're going to have the ID and also what this shark name is. You might be wondering, why am I talking about sharks? Well, this refers back to the talk in 2019. So if you watch that, it should flow on very uh, nicely. Um, so you define this template and this is all in your application code and you define these template variables. And then the second step is then you pass this template to some shared component. So here we've got this um, selector and we're going to define our template inside of it. So as a child, and then that selector is, um, is set up to look for the option template label and it will read in that template. So now within this selector component, it's got a reference to the template that we've provided as a child. 
And then this is where the, the magic starts. So this select component will pass it a list of options. And so we're using NG4 then to run through all of those options. And instead of just using, you know, just one property from the option that will always be the same, we can render it using this template, which has been passed in. So here we're using ng template outlet and we give it the reference to that template. Say, so use this template to render the value. And then we've got this ng template outlet context. And this is where those let syntax variables get populated from. So this dollar implicit, that will go to what we had as let shark. And the index is where we had let ID equals index. So you've got a way of referring to those values within your template. And so then going back to that talk again, what this means is you can have two different clients. And here these two clients were they're a lot younger than they are now. Um, but the way they can use the same shared component, but they can pass whatever they want into it. So for example, client one, you know, he's using an icon library. Client two is just, you know, appending Latin. So they're, they're able to provide these customizations um, completely separate from the implementation of the shared component. So this is why it gives you so much um, flexibility and able to customize how something is rendered within a shared component. But that shared component has to have absolutely no knowledge about what you're using in that template. But it's the, the, the way that you can access, you know, each option via this let shark. That's something which none of the other features of Angular do. So you can't use content projection. You can't just use, um, well, just, you know, string manipulation. If you want to use, um, your own HTML syntax and and other features like this icon library. So this that's what ng template gives us. But there was a big issue in 2019. And after the talk, people would come up to me and say, well, can you can you type it? Uh, and because this is something which, you know, Angular, even back then, was really good on uh, TypeScript and types. And especially when strict templates came in, you know, this became a bit of a drawback for ng template outlets because people are so used to their templates being type checked and getting errors when something was wrong. So what do I mean by there's no typing of template variables? So here, if we look at this code, when we're passing the list of sharks to the selector, we can see that the client one component it's, and the sharks variable is correctly typed as a shark array. But within our template, where we've got ng template, and we've got this let shark, that's not typed as a shark. That can be anything. So inside the template, we can do shark dot anything wrong, and there's there's no error, but our code would be broken. And so it's, it's this um, like breakdown in types where we know what we're doing, and we know what should be there as a shark, but we haven't got a way of telling Angular actually this syntax, this let shark variable, that should be a shark. And, and so I think quite a few people then decided, well, I don't want to use ng template outlets because, because of this, these potential issues. But now in 2023, 20, we can, and probably a bit earlier, um, but definitely now. So that's what we're gonna look at now is how do we type ng template outlets? And so the first two steps is we're going to use a directive to retrieve the template instead of just the hash syntax. And we're going to use this ng template context guard um, to apply typing information to that directive. And for some people, that's going to be all you need to do. Um, but then if you want to take things a step further, we'll also look at an approach that you can use generic types uh, via an input to make um, your ng template use generic typing. So for example, in this selector approach, you know, we might want to use it for lots of different lists of items. And then finally, we'll look at how using Angular 16 gives you strict typing for the ng template outlet context. So 
Step one, we need to use a directive to identify the template. So here we can define this very simple directive with a selector of saying ng template, square brackets, and then option template. And what that selector will match is the code at the bottom of the slide where we've got ng template and then option template. So the only change here when we're defining our template is we've removed the hash symbol because now we're not giving it a label, we're applying this directive to it. So our template will look like this, end your template, option template, you know, the let shark still the same. And then inside the shared component, we update our content child to look for that directive and read the template reference from it. So instead of looking for the, the label, uh, we're now gonna look for the template with the option directive. And then we're going to use this new construct of ng template context guard. And so this is from the Angular docs. Um, so what is this for? So it's saying if your structural directive provides a context to the instantiated template, you can properly type it inside the template by providing a static ng template context guard function. And now I would hope that you know exactly what it's doing um, from this sentence. Um, but you might not, so we'll we'll step through it. <laughs> so the way to think about ng template context guard is it's a bit like um, well, it's very similar to in TypeScript where you have a type assertion assertion, um, and so that's you'll see what we're going to do here is say, well, this is the type that my context um, uh, follows or the interface that it follows. So when Angular sees this directive it can say, well, actually, it's going to be able to provide this context to you. So the first thing for us to do is to look at our ng template outlet context. And we're providing it a option and also the index of where that option is rendered in the list. So we can define this interface option context. And for now, we're just going to say, well, the implicit value, um, that's just going to be a name and which is a string property and the index is a number. So depending on how your component is working, this context interface will be different. And then this is the magic part of the code, um, which when you first look at it, it's like, what is going on here? Um, but the way to read this um, code is that you take your directive that we're now using to identify the template and we add this static property. So we do ng template context card, and we say, well, this is the directive, it's the option directive. When the static card runs, we don't know what the context is, but this is always gonna return true, and our context is going to be of the type option context. So this is just really a way of saying, this directive will expose this interface. Um, it's it's not the easiest thing to read, but it's it's just the magic ingredient to making this work. So once you've done that, you go back to your template and you'll see this let shark is now correctly typed as what the implicit value is, and the ID will be typed as a number. So now we get this template type checking, and so you know we've got shark or anything wrong, and that is now correctly highlighted as an error, and. So this might be all you need to do um, in your use of ng template outlet. Um, and we've so we've maintained all this flexibility, but we're now able to introduce this type safety and get the best of both worlds. So that's really great. Um, but what about generic types? Because for our selector component or list component or anything where you're doing this kind of really generic, um, I guess, rendering, it might also be the fact that you want to use generic types. So the first step will be to say, okay, well, let's take that option context and let's make it generic. So now instead of passing back an object with a name property, we're going to say, well, actually, it's going to take this T item as the generic and my implicit value will just be that T item. So we're going to aim for that to be a shark. So the full shark interface. 
And then we go to our directive and we'll say, well, let's make that um, generic as well. So we can have our option directive, which takes a TI sim generic. Now, you might notice um, when you try to do this, you can't pass that T item generic directly to your ng template context guard because it's a static property. So it can't access the directives generic property. So we'll give it a different name, T context item. But these are going to, Angular um, is going to tie these together for us. But just be aware you can't use the same value um, because TypeScript will complain at you. But don't worry about that. Angular will, will work it out. But we do that, and then suddenly our types are broken. Shark has now gone from being correctly defined to being any. So now you're thinking, oh, we, all we tried to do is make it generic, but now we've broken it. And this comes down to the fact that the way that Angular supports generics is that it needs to be able to infer the type and it often uses an input property, so a generic input property to infer that type. But our directive doesn't have an input property. And so Angular is unable to work out, well, what is the generic type? And so I've, go, I've written a blog post about this, um, which you can find as, do, does Angular do generics, which goes into a lot more detail about how Angular can give us the same um, kind of generic support as you might expect from this uh, syntax. So what we're going to try now is, well, can we add an input to this directive so that Angular is then able to correctly infer the inputs? So here we're going to add this input options, um, which is then going to be a T item array. And that will be on our, on our generic type. Um, and as I said, Angular will link the T context item for the context guard to that T item. So now when we're defining our template, if we also include this options value and pass it the list of sharks, that enables Angular to have the information to be able to say, well, actually the shark is um, a type of shark. And once you include that extra input value, then the template can be correctly typed. So there's a bit of... Um, uh, like pros and cons of this approach, because we're adding this options input to our template just for the typing. So that options isn't used by the template. Um, so this could be potentially a bit confusing to users, but it will come down to the fact of how your template is used. And it might be that if you use different syntax, but there's shorthand syntax for ng template outlets, which kind of is slightly more um, concise and it makes it easier to pass this options in. But again, it could be confusing to users. So if you're doing this for external people or for other users in your application, documenting the fact that this is just for types is probably an important thing to do. Um, but currently there's no other way around this issue. So it's, it's one of those benefits. So if you want to use a generic component, you're going to have to build, you're going to have to help Angular out a bit. Um, so working out the interface of your directive is, is going to be important. So for us, it, it kind of makes sense that you pass it the full list of sharks um, and it can define the generic type off that. Um, but that's just something to be aware of in how you name this um, and how you use it and share it with your users. But at the end result of that is that we get the correct types. And then if we come to Angular 16, um, thanks to Thomas, I think he's already had a mention this evening, um, the ng template outlet context is now strictly typed. So before Angular 16, you could write a wrong property on your outlet context and there would be no error. But with Angular 16, thanks to his PR, it now correctly matches the outlet context to the interface that you provided um, to the template reference. And I think I have to say another big thanks to Thomas for 
his work and in this blog post, which is where I've learned about how to do these types. So I just want to give a, a shout out to, to Thomas. So you should definitely follow him and, and read his original post on this topic. But that's that brings my talk to, to a finish. And so I hope you're now happy to type ng template outlets. And this can be a new feature for you to produce really customizable components. Thank you. Loved it. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was excellent learning. Uh, there is one question for you so far in Q and A. If anybody has, you know, I think we have time for a couple questions here, but any more, put them in the Q and A, and we'll get to them. But can you see them, or do you need me to read them to you? Yep, I can see them. Okay. So, what does generic type now correctly inferred mean? So, if we come, I think this slide will help explain that. The here we are. So considering our um, your selector, so that, that's going to render a list of these items. The Depending on your use case, that might be a different um, type of thing. So I might have a list of sharks in my application, which are types of the shark. In another place, I might want to use the shared component to display, I don't know, a list of tractors. Um, and so those those two interfaces are different um but we want our template to respect the interface that we provide to it so in this case we provide it a list of sharks which are types of shark and um, so within the template we want all the properties that are valid for a shark but then where we define our template for you know say a list of tractors we want that those template variables to respect the interface for the tractor um and I guess if you're referring to um, this um, part of it, I'm not sure um, which section, then by inferred, I mean that the Angular template type checker okay. knows what the properties are in, inside your template, which is then, I guess, powered by the Angular language service. I don't know. I might not have answered it, but I think this blog post will probably help explain some of the um, intricacies of that. Awesome. And then, yeah, I, I think, you know, again, just everybody, you can reach out to Stephen on Twitter or we've got that that Discord channel that you can post any of your questions there. And even if our speakers aren't able to be there, I think the community as a whole can help kind of answer these questions. But Huge thank you to all four of you. Those were four excellent presentations. I feel like I've learned a lot. I'm certainly sure I'm not alone in that. So I, I think, you know, on behalf of the whole community, just want to say thank you, Stephen. That was a great little insight into your presentation at NGConf. So looking forward to that. It'll be exciting. I, I just can't believe it's only three weeks away. I don't know how that happened. It was like Christmas two days ago. So, <laughs> yeah. right? It was, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs>